And it came to pass, whilst he blessed them, he departed from them and was carried up to heaven. And they, adoring, went back into Jerusalem with great joy. Where it's taken from the Gospel of Luke. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. There is a worldly joy and a heavenly joy. Blessed are ye that weep now, for you shall laugh. Woe to you that now laugh, for you shall weep and mourn. Also from Luke. In most relationships, usually romantic ones, there is a four, four level or four stage, four stages, four stages of romantic love. You see this also in religious vocations and in a lot of things. First stage is infatuation. It's that stage when the beloved looks, you've met someone and you see all these great things about them and that's all you can see. All you see are the good things and that's maybe what they're showing you too. But you don't know a lot about them, but what you do know you like. There's a lot of your imagination going on there too because you have to fill in a lot of gaps and you don't notice it, but you're filling in a lot of things with your own imagination. And that's what infatuation is because you don't actually see the real person you see a, a partial fiction, partially real, partially fictional, and you've fallen in love with that because it's too good to be true. Then there comes the stage of realization when the truth breaks itself in into that infatuation stage and you see those faults or they show them to you and you realize that what you had in your mind wasn't the way it really is in reality. Then follows despair when you you realize just how awful this person or thing or whatever really is, you see it in the full light of day. After that follows true love, if you make it that far. Most people give up when they hit despair. And there's some people that make a habit out of just cruising from one relationship in the infatuation stage. I'm just going to stay as long. Once I start seeing unpleasantness, I'm just going to leave. And then I'm going to move on to something else to be infatuated with. It works great. Well, not really, because you live in a dreamland. We don't want to do that. That's not real joy. Now, the disciples knew Christ, but not fully. They knew that he was before, before his death. They knew that he was the Savior. But they didn't fully understand the cost he would have to pay. They still envisioned success and defeat in worldly terms. But you shall lament and weep, but the world shall rejoice. Their worldly expectations were ruined. Their infatuation with a certain idea of a savior was crushed. The image that they had built in their mind of this is how things are supposed to go was completely destroyed. And so for 40 days, our Lord is present with them in the flesh, proving to them the truth of his resurrection, showing them and teaching them how he was supposed to die how this is how he became our savior, how he was our savior, how he is our savior, where his kingdom truly is. He replaces their dashed, their false hopes, their imagined ideas with the reality, which is far better than they had imagined. Now, of course, and it's amazing to say, some of them aren't happy. They have everything they wanted, they see our Lord risen from the dead, and they actually don't believe. You don't know. They clinging to that thing they built up in their imagination, maybe. No, it's supposed to be like this, because I said so. Well, all right, all right. Then after 40 days of this, exactly 40 days, the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ fills his disciples with great joy, with a heavenly joy, not an earthly joy. Now they know where their true home is. Now human nature itself has ascended above the heights. Now Christ reigns above all, impervious to all the evils on earth. And this, too, is how we ought to rejoice today and always. We do not rejoice as the world does. As much as we may enjoy the nice things of the world, we must not set our hearts on them. 
and we must beware lest any earthly creature cause us too much joy. Especially, usually, a prospective spouse. Not so much afterwards. And so our joy looks different, ought to look different, from the infatuation that the worldlings have with the things of the world. It's always infatuation. You can't get real joy out of things in the world. You're imagining that this thing, this video game or whatever, will give you real joy. And it doesn't. Reality crashes in and you get bored with it. The joy of the world is giddy. It's all emotion and no reason. It's precipitous and hasty. Whereas for us, as long as we live in this life, this battlefield, this trial, our joy will always be tinged with sadness, with trepidation and worry, not, hopefully, of worldly things, of earthly things, but of spiritual ones. For as long as one is standing, he can fall. Gregorian chant is a wonderful example of the difference between true spiritual joy befitting the true disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ and worldly joy, that giddy emotional infatuation. Pope Benedict XIV instructs that sacred music must not have a passionate character. He says, let chant and music be serious, devout, clear, suitable to God's house and to divine praise, executed in such a manner that those who listen to it understand the words and be moved to devotion. It's supposed to move us to devotion, not make us tap our feet. Pope Gregory XVI adds that music intended for execution in churches must differ from profane and theatrical music, not only in its melodies but in its general style. Too lively or exciting movements are forbidden. If the words be joyous, it should be expressed by the sweetness of religious mirth and not by the unbridled liveliness of the dance. Again, we see very clearly, just listening to different kinds of music, the true joy, the Christian joy that pervades all of Gregorian chant contrasted with, if you will, the false joy, that infatuation you might find, you know, in pop music or something like that, or things that emulate it. It is only when we ground our joy, when we ground our happiness in Christ, that we shall find true happiness, that we shall find true joy. If we look for success or satisfaction or appreciation or contentment in the world, or in any created thing, or any created person, we shall be disappointed. If we do rejoice in things of the world, it will be a false joy, always dashed, and always leaving us unhappy. Woe to you that now laugh, for you shall weep and mourn. To have true joy, then, in this life, we must follow the footsteps of the apostles after the ascension. What does it say in Luke? And they, adoring, went back into Jerusalem with great joy. They did not leave Jerusalem. They did not leave the world with its trials and torments and unpleasant people. Rather, they only left this world by martyrdom, total, complete, painful, rejected, and cursed, just as Christ was. They do not leave Jerusalem. So do not be so foolish as to think that your joy lies in escaping the evils of this world, in finding some place where people love you perfectly, where everything tastes good, where everything bows to your whim, and no one and nothing ever disappoints you. Instead, the apostles go back adoring, they find their joy in adoration. They have fixed themselves, they have grounded themselves on what lasts, on what really matters. They hold their faith in the resurrection so firmly that no worldly evil can ever dislodge it. They have in their hearts a true conversation 
with our Lord reigning in heaven. And for you also, find your joy in adoration, in prayer, in contemplation of heavenly things, in friendship with the saints, in the frequent worship of our Lord at Holy Mass and exposition and in the sacrament of confession. We must not again judge things by the way the people of the world judge it. Joy is not having a giddy smile on your face and skipping around like a loon. As long as you are in true adoration, then you have joy in your soul, whatever expression you have on your face. So do not seek to cultivate the giddy, blasphemous, foolish joy of the worldling who delights in the world and the trivial and has contempt for what is sacred and holy, serious and devout. But rejoice all the same. The Christian who goes away to Jerusalem adoring still goes joyfully. His heart is less troubled by worldly problems. They don't hold on to you as much. They don't hold them down. Eh, eh, who cares? But his heart lives in Christ. It lives for heaven. He is not downcast. Because if you haven't put your hopes on things in this world, you won't be too disappointed when it all fails. His hopes have been fulfilled already by our Lord's ascension into heaven. Christ is risen, he ascended, and he reigns even now. The good Christian can love things rightly then. He can love people rightly, not only because he loves God more, but because his heart is set in adoration, has put the first things first. When you have the first things first, and everything else falls into place underneath that. And you can actually enjoy temporal things, making sure they don't take over. Finally, there is, of course, no better companion to, to have, no guide to have on our way back to Jerusalem, rejoicing, adoring God, than our Blessed Mother Mary, who went back with the apostles who rejoiced with them, who rejoices with us now. So long as we have her, as we will have her, so long as we choose to have her for our true companion. Be friends with our Blessed Mother. Adore God with her. Keep her close to you. When we do that, she will teach us how to adore. She will teach us how to walk through Jerusalem of this life without caring so much. She will teach us, she will show us where her heart is set. Her heart is set only on God, only on Christ, only and nothing else. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.